recording the rule. Recording the rules now. Thank you, John. All yours. Cool. Thank you, guys. All right, so I'm going to start you guys off on a page you will probably never have to see, uh, but I do want to just talk to it uh, as part of the overall understanding of how rules work. Um, we have this area called approval types. Uh, when CGI does the creation of the new organizations, uh, additionally, they will come to this page and they will add an entry into here uh, for that new organization. Um, as an example, if I take away this filter, you'll see every organization has one. Uh, it is a minimum, uh, kind of just very, it needs to be there uh, just to make sure everything works across the board. Otherwise, when you try to create a rule, you're going to click on a field and you're not going to be able to find the data you need. Um, so uh, that being said, hopefully you are never here, but uh, I can kind of show you what happens or at least point to it from what you are going to be viewing um, to be able to say, hey, it looks like you didn't set up a type, John, you forgot. Um, yeah, just those kind of things. So let me share these meeting controls. So we're going to talk a little bit about rules for our new organization that we just set up. We're going to head to our manage and go to approval rules. Now, this is a list of every single rule that we have in the entire system. Um, so obviously these filters are going to play a huge part, um, but for our particular organization at this point, they do not have any rules set up. Uh, so we're gonna just start from scratch with a brand new rule. I'm gonna do my best to try to talk through it, uh, to compare a little bit of what you guys are used to doing and seeing today um, versus kind of what the future is with even next. Because uh, honestly, this is something that still, and I don't really understand how, after two years of thinking about how to really solution this, I, I still get really excited about how this all works. Because I think it is very powerful. Uh, and I think it has a lot more flexibility than what we had in the past. Um, and really, it puts the power more in your guys' hands, too. You don't have to wait for CGI to, you know, I know you guys create ARs and you guys yell at me when I'm slow and I'm sorry. I, I try to get to them as quick as I can, but now you guys don't have to wait on me. You can do it all yourself without any of my help, which is, is you know, hopefully a good thing. Um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the, the setup for this page and go from there. Someone have a question? Oh, sorry, but I heard somebody chat. All right. So, Remember when I said, if you don't set up a type, you won't be able to fill out a field? It's this guy right here. So if I haven't added the John field that I just created, uh, when you click this dropdown, you're not gonna be able to find that entity. Uh, this is, at a, at a high level, it's a way of grouping rules. Um, it's not something that we will use day one, but it allows us flexibility down the line to potentially add multiple types, which is kind of like multiple buckets of rules, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, but for now, we're going to keep it simple. Every entity has one bucket, one type, uh, which you will choose here. The next area that I want to focus on is organization. This is where your rule fires. So the rule itself will either be a entity rule or an agency rule or a signer rule, as you guys know it today or it will be a site rule or a <laughs> license org rule, as you guys know today with, with your, your dollar approvers, for instance. So we have a few options. You can see I can, I can even set up rules at the sub-entity level. We're gonna not worry about that for now. Um, but first we're gonna create the closest equivalent to a signer rule. So. I select my entity so that everyone under my entity, any site within my entity has to follow this rule. The order, as you guys are aware or have previously seen, is the rule token, uh, Bisense rule token. So this is where in the list does this fire? Is it first? If it's first, then you make it one. If it's somewhere after one that exists, Let's say 40 is your current rule. You can make it 50 and that will fire after. Um, if it's something that you wanna fire towards the end, 
you're talking more in the 97 ish range. Um, that's a little bit of today's and how things will be converted in will all be from that zero to 100 because that's what exists today. Moving forward, this can actually be as big as 9,999, which means if you needed to, for any reason, make 9,999 rules, you could do it. And they would all fire in the order that they need to fire in. Again, realistically, that's not going to happen, uh, but we did expand that a little bit so we have a little more flexibility to move things around. Some groups get a little tight with the, the 100 even, uh, so having a little bit more space uh, will allow for some flexibility. So in this case, I'm going to make a, a signer rule for, uh, let's see what I want to do it for. Let's do a purchase category. We have the ability to set up a rule and we need to, I need to take a note for this mark. We need to remove DPS administrative requests from this. Take a note. Um, we have the ability to create rules for either confirming orders or purchases. So let's say you have a rule that does not apply at all to confirming orders. This would be how you kind of set it up at a basic level. You have your type, where it fires, your organization is at the entity level, the description of the rule, purchase. Uh, you'll see here the only other required fields are these threshold from and to. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, this will be from zero to 5,000, let's say as an example. Uh, or if it's a very small number to a very big number, you could do something along the lines of that to this, right? You just wanna make sure that in no world would they exceed this number. Um, there's not like a, a max or a minimum, it's just looking at the dollar value for the entire requisition to decide if it fires or not. So we'll, we'll stick with a, a more realistic one of let's say zero to a thousand. Now, as I mentioned, and some of you may be aware of our like confirming overall, or sorry, confirming order override rule. Instead of creating override rules, really you're defining the rule to fire when you want it to fire. We're giving more flexibility to the rule itself to be able to really look at the business reason why an approval needs to take place and build it in one rule. So we're not having to manage, oh, well, if I make this rule, but then if someone uses a P card, then we're not gonna use the rule. Instead, you would just create a rule and we would say, if this is a rule, if you're only, or if you're not using a P card, then we would just add that we're not using a P card to this rule. If, for instance, you wanted to add a purchase category like routine, oops, we could do that right here. And then you can kind of see, hopefully, you can really build these rules to be multifaceted. It doesn't have to be just one thing or another. Now, from a conversion standpoint, we had no way of grouping these very well. Um, so there will be some organizations that see this kind of functionality and come to you guys and say, hey, I want to make this rule a little more uh, complex, if you will, um, where they're going to come in and they're going to say, okay, well, I want to make this rule uh, if you're only if you're not using a P card or changing thresholds, or maybe if you're only using a certain commodity with the routine category we can add multiple pieces here. And that really drives um, kind of the, the power behind it, um, which is very, very cool in my opinion. Um, now you'll see we have a, a few things and I'll kind of go through each field just to, to talk through it. Um, if you ever wanted to have a rule that fires for both purchasing and confirming, it's as easy as adding both of them here. If you only want to confirming, then you would re remove this here and you can kind of see the, the flexibility we get here. SWAM categories, 
we have the ability to either require certain options. So the rule would fire if it's small business or the rule would fire if you click this excluding, if it's not small business. So kind of the reverse between the two. Um, so that gives us flexibility instead of having to uncheck small and then click everything else, we can just click small and exclude, uh, which is more, it's the business talk, I think, um, with a lot of these agencies where they say, oh, well, we want this rule to fire for anything other than micro. Now you can kind of do that all within in the rule itself. So um, we've got a few more fields on here, and I do want to talk a little bit about uh, what happens after I click save the first time. So you'll notice most of this information is at the header level. Um, we have a few things like asset flag, uh, which is actually at the allocation. Um, but we've got a lot of different things that we can more or less filter our rules by. Additionally, on this left-hand side, after I've saved that same COA logic that we used to build uh, everything within the system actually applies to the rules as well. So the system knows you are buying in John, or sorry, you're creating a rule for John's entity. I have fiscal year cost center and agency use one turned on. If I want to make a rule that fires off of this, it's as easy as clicking one option. If there were multiples, I could click and it would add more and more and more all the way down. Uh, same concept for fiscal year. I could show you a few just to show how it expands and contracts. Um, but you can see here, if instead of having you know one line per rule that we have to do today where you know, you'd set I'll, I'll use fiscal year as the example because we have multiples there. So you guys would have one rule as 2003, right? And then if you wanted to do to wanted to do 2004, you'd have to make a whole another rule, whole other row when you're doing your your bulk loads today. Now you're coming in and you're just picking another piece, and then picking another piece, and it's all applying to the same rule. So it gives you flexibility where you can combine things you can put it all in one rule. If you need to, for whatever reason, uh, for instance, let's say for this rule, we only want it to fire for 2003, but then for a different rule where maybe you use um, the purchase category of proprietary, you only want it to fire for 2004. You know, you have that flexibility now to be able to do it. Whereas before it was pretty much, you have to pick the field. Um, for those of you who know the sign rule set up, um, ARs that you send, usually me that are completing them. You send the field or the rule that you want to use, the field that you want to fire off of, how many characters into the field you're going to set up the rule for, and then what, and then you add all the data behind that. So instead of going through all of that, you can just do it through here, where you can say what the, where it fires, what level it fires, what type of requisitions it fires, and then the criteria for when it fires, all in one nice little page. Again, this will be built based on the organization that you're creating the rules for, which again is defined in this organization dropdown right here. So if I picked a different organization and saved, my allocation would look very different. The last tab, uh, which as I was starting to go through this, I realized I haven't actually created an approval profile to show you, um, but I can still kind of talk to it. This is the approval profiles. Now, today you guys know this as roles. The closest comparison is roles. The difference in what we did um, from a, a design and really locking a lot of the duplicates out is we removed uh, the prefix. So normally, you know, you've got your A136 dash account line approver one or A194 dash account line approver one. And you could do this into perpetuity, right? It's, it's all the ones you need. Instead, we cut out that prefix and we've allowed you to either use something that's standardized 
So accounting code approver, uh, I'll use as this example. When I save, you'll see, I don't actually have any approvers in this organization that have this role. So even at the rule level, you can look, is the rule set up correctly? Is it for the right organization with the correct criteria? When you select the approval profile, you can select one that exists within the system and it will only fire for users that have access to this organization. So let me, let me take a second just to kind of talk through that part because I know that can be very confusing. Um, here. So when we get, when we talk about users having access to a particular approval profile, what I mean is when we're looking at our users, there's an area under user preferences called approval profiles. This approval profile list is everything in the entire system. It's all of the approval profiles, but the rule logic looks at your user, what your user's orga is, and then what the rule is. And it ties all those things together so that we don't need to have all these duplicate approval profiles out there. So in this case, let me, what's this accounting code approver? If I give this user, which was my, my requisitioner, which isn't the best example, right? Because it's the same person who's creating things. But if I give them access here and I save, you'll see I now appear in this list as the approver. So you can really from start to finish when you're creating a new rule, you define all the criteria, you pick your approval profile based on the list that you see here. Um, and this is something I need to take a note on as well, because I don't believe you guys will have the ability to create a new approval profile with the way we have things set up right now. Um, but in theory, I can walk you guys through that. as well. So currently under config, and I, again, I think we need to honestly move approval profiles under this manage tab. Um, it's just not there right now. But approval profiles is really where you can add any profiles you need. So let's say you couldn't find one that existed already within the system. You want to call it something specific. So I call it John rule. It's gonna be in general set up at the entity level. EVA wide is really more for, um, let me make sure that I explain this well, cause I know it can also be confusing. Entity is going to look at the rule and it's going to say, okay, who are the users that have access to this entity? And that's the approvers. If you have a situation such as, um, let's say shared services, which I, they're my favorite and I, talk about them all the time because they have some of the most uh, fun use cases, you would actually set them up as EVA wide. And what this does is no matter what, when someone chooses this profile, John Rule Approver, the same people, no matter what, will always be in that, that role, in that approval category. Entity will only look at who has access to the entity to be able to approve. Hopefully that distinction makes sense. I know it's a lot and it, it will involve some playing around um, for you guys to kind of see how it all kind of works together. But in general, for most situations, you will be choosing an entity level approver. Uh, we'll go ahead and save this. Um, you have the ability to actually add users here um, if you want to, and it does the exact same thing that it would do uh, if I'm on this page. So if I refresh this, I should see my new approval profile added. So John rule approval. So you can kind of do it in two different places. Uh, 
Well, we do need to, and Mark, I'll, I have a note to figure out where we need to put this so that everyone so, has a chance for that. This is Sandra. So just to, to repeat that, if we created, let's say, um, the governor revises his executive order on plastics and says that anyone using the commodity code for this needs to be approved by the agency head, then we could create the role as you just defined it. And then within the entity, say who's in that role. Absolutely. Okay. You want to do that at Eva Wide? So, right. So let's say you did it Eva Wide and said, this is the role and everybody has to do this and it's Eva Wide. And then who's in that with each agency, right? So it's not that it's just Shane in that role because it's an Eva Wide approval, but it's an Eva Wide role that then so, becomes specific to the, the entity. So it's, yeah, and let me just clarify right. too to make sure I'm understanding. <laughs> so in that case, let, let's say in, in your example, you've got plastics, right? So there's a rule that's set up as an EVA wide rule for plastics and Shane is the only approver for everyone. Any order that comes in with plastic, he needs to see it. You would set that up as an EVA wide approver. You do it once, you set up the rules individually at each entity. So when you're actually doing your, your rule setup, you would say for this rule, for these organizations, they require Shane to approve them or the plastics reviewer to approve them. You would select the evil wide plastic approver profile and Shane will be there regardless of who creates or where that rule fires. That's the, the power of the EVA wide rule. If you set it up as entity, Shane would have to have access in his orga perimeter to see those organizations to be the approver for it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Well, I know it's very different and it's hopefully a lot more flexibility and a lot more power. Uh, but we're going to go back to John. We're going to go back to our rule that I created with the uh, county. So you saw I was able to very easily just look through organization, find what I needed, create my rule. If I needed to add additional allocations, I could. You can see when I come here, my accounting code approver is John Caps, an example, and I can do this real quick. Um, let's go to, since we're talking about Shane, we're going to give Shane some, some power. We go here, and we're going to add Shane to two things. We're going to add him as the account, what is this one called? Accounting code approver. I don't know why I keep forgetting that. And look at all these things you have. Accounting code approver. And we're going to save just as is accounting code approver. That's it. Now, at this point, for my brand new organization, Shane does not have purview. So when I come to this approvers, his name will not appear here yet because he only can approve for his entity, which at this point does not include the new one that we created this morning. So what we'll do is we'll actually come in here. And we'll give him a little bit more, which I'll, I'll come back in and remove it later for you, Shane, so I don't mess up here. Oops, we're not in Department of General Services. No biggie, it's UAT, you can leave me in there. Ooh, okay. So we'll expand these guys and we'll give him full purview over all of this and we'll save. Now, when I come back to my rule and I refresh my page, head down to approvers, you'll see Shane is in here now. So it's a combination of things that really give us the, the full flexibility that I, I know from, you know, I've worked with a lot of you for a lot of years. A lot of the times I have to tell you guys no, right? Like when someone wants a certain rule or something a certain way, I have to say, well, you know, we can do this or maybe we can do these kind of weird options. 
I, I have yet to really come across a rule within the even next solution that I haven't been able to make work. Um, it is a lot of flexibility um, with a lot of power. Uh, and I think it, it has the potential to really kind of get back to the, the basics of, okay, what's the business reason for something to be approved? And if that's the case, define what that rule is and kind of how it works. Uh, now I know we still have 22 years worth of rules that are converted into the system. And those will all work as they do today within the new system. So there will be some level of an organization comes to you guys most likely and says, hey, I want to clean up my rules or I want to do things differently. And you almost kind of take it organization by organization and people that are proactive and want to do things, you work through them and really kind of ask the questions for, okay, how do you want this to work? Um, and then there are going to be people that don't and have the exact same setup they've had for 20 years. And that's fine too. Um, but really it, the flexibility to have both is, is very powerful. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what the rules look like when they fire uh, as a user. So I'll go in as my uh, JCAPS user, the John Caps. And we'll, we'll look at the requisition that we created previously, and then we'll, we'll look at the look ahead functionality and kind of talk a little bit about that. Uh, additionally, and I hope you guys kind of realized as I was going through all this, this is all real time. Like this is all instant. It's all one solution. There's no back and forth. It's you want to see how a rule works. You can go in UAT and see how a rule works. If, and I, I hope we get to this point. Um, I know we kind of did it the last at least probably four or five years of really getting things into UAT to test fully, make sure it's working and approved um, by you know the different agencies and then moving it to production once we know it's, it's good to go. Um, the fact that we can do it all in real time makes that process much easier <laughs> than trying to do um, a longer a longer solution. Um, I'm going to remove this P card and save because I think that was how I had the rule set up was no P card. And if I click on my workflow and ad hoc, you'll see here my rule at rule order 50. Now, this is the preview. And we, we've done a little bit of work here recently um, where we've tried to combine some functionality uh, with a couple different pages. Uh, I'm not going to submit this one yet, but the, the power here is you can see how the rule is set up, who should fire, where it fires, all of that when you're setting up the rule itself. And then when you come in to test as the users, you can come and you can look at this workflow preview and you can preview to see that it fires the way you expect it to. So for instance, in this case, this should fire this way because my purchase category was routine with no P card. So if I change this to emergency and I click save, I would expect that rule to disappear, right? So instead of having to toggle between different things and try different um, options very quickly, and I didn't click save, so that's not bad. Bad on my part, always click save. Um, you can very easily see how rules fire to really test that it's working the way you expect it to. You know, another piece of criteria for this was if it's within a thousand dollars. So let's say I make the unit price thousand and one. And I save and close. I save and then I look at the preview. I would expect my rule to not be there anymore, right? Because that's, we only set it from zero to a thousand. So it, it kind of puts the, the power back in your guys' hands to really create the rules and be able to look at it from a business standpoint and say, is this working the way I expect it to work? And then be able to hand it to the agencies and say, is this the way you expect it to work? Um, and show them this power and show them how they can see these previews without even clicking submit yet. Um, and I think that 
that adds a lot more than what we can do today. A lot of the times, you know, we create a rule and uh, something happens to it uh, along the way and we say, oh, well, that's, that's bad. That didn't work right. And then we have to just go change it. Um, I think we have a lot more capability at this point to really test, make sure the rules are working as expected. And then worst case, if it's not, it's a simple change and it is all real time, instantaneous, no waiting for overnight cycles, none of that. It's all just right here. Um, so that, that's one rule. Um, and I wanna talk about, that's kind of more of the, the signer rule level. I do wanna talk briefly about um, if you need to set up a buy sense org level or a, a site level rule, it's gonna be the exact same process. Um, just when you choose your organization, you're gonna choose the, the site instead of the entity. So we can do that real quick. Let's go manage rules. We'll do new rule. And I'll kind of fill this out kind of quickly just to speed things up. We want, let's say we want this to fire after our 50 that we know exists. Um, and then we want to do John. We're setting this at the site level as opposed to the entity. So this is more in line with a, a site level or a buy sensoric specific rules, which today we have like dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, those sorts of things. Now you can set up any kind of rule across any different levels. So now think of all the, the, the signer rules that you guys have, you can apply those to the buy sensor levels and vice versa. So it's interesting and kind of adds a lot of flexibility there. Uh, site level, we'll stick with purchase as our type. Uh, we'll do zero to a thousand again. Maybe we'll do 2000 this time. Uh, and we will make the purchase category routine, the same as before. We'll head down to our approvers. Just for the purpose of time, I'm gonna stick with the accounting code approver. Save and close. We'll head back to our user. So we can see what the requisition now looks like. So you can see in the matter of, again, 30 seconds or so, I created a rule that fires at the site level with a little different parameters, uh, but you can see it follows the order. It says these will fire before this. Uh, same thing as rule tokens today. If I change some of the criteria, let's say we'll, we'll kind of do this the same exercise. If I change the PO category, both of the rules are firing off of routine. So in this case, all of the rules would disappear. If I set this back to routine and I go down and I change the dollar amount, let's say to something over a thousand, the first rule, which is the, the entity level rule, will no longer fire because I'm out of the threshold. Whereas the site level rule was from zero to 2000. So I would expect to see that rule here. So again, you can, this is a very simple version of approvals. I know you guys have many more examples that I'm sure you are currently even thinking, hey, can I do this? Um, and I, I think starting out, know that this is not a, hey, I'm gonna give you guys a, a quick demo on a Monday morning and now you're just gonna go do it. Um, know that we are still here to be able to help support and <coughs> really help through some of those tough use cases where we can really build out what the, the correct options are moving forward. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm very excited about that because I, I hated, hated being in rooms with you guys where I had to say no. It can't, we can't do that. We can't help you basically follow your business process because our current solution doesn't allow for it. Um, again, I, I think in the way that I've tested and reviewed this, um, 
I, I have not run into something that I, I can't do. I'm sure there is, and I'm sure you guys have business rules and process that I, I haven't even begun to think about, but at a high level, this gives us so much more flexibility moving forward. Um, and it still allows from a conversion standpoint that when people come in day one, everything should still look very, very similar and work very, very similar outside of, you know, the few rules that were excluded, like the override rules um, and some of the other ones along the way. But in general, buy sense org rules, sign rules were all converted. Um, they have a lot of power and really it, it's, a, it's a pretty cool, cool setup. Um, so these were, I just wanted to show you guys when you come back to this approval rules, if you ever want to look at the um, different rules, you can search individually by site. So I could remove this and search and it'll just pull up the, the site level rules. Uh, or you can kind of come into the see all. I want to say this one's a tree. And you can view it at the, the kind of hierarchical level. Um, so let's look at, for instance, Department of General Services. So we'll, let's say we want to look at everything at both the entity and all the sites. You would click this little select all, it'll select all the ones beneath it. Um, and you would choose the entity, which is this one right here. Let's see, they're all checked. If I click close, it'll pull up absolutely everything, really long list, but this will really give you everything within. You can scroll through these, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I'd say the easiest way to just come in and click download table. So if you ever need to review, let's say a given organization and their sites, uh, you can go through here and it will give you a, a nice clean cut of absolutely everything. So in this case, what, there's 1400 rows. So imagine trying to scroll through that on the UI. It's not, not the best. Um, but this will allow you to, to kind of go in and review things at a high level if you need to, um, to see what the rules are. Obviously, this isn't gonna be the full rule criteria. I know I've worked a little bit with Renato on our development side to try to come up with a way to be able to visualize it at a very macro level. Um, but if you need to at least be able to review and look through the rules that exist, can do it that way. Um, but at the end of the day, if you want to see how a rule works, you would come in here. You'd say this is a commodity one approver. It fires for both confirming order and purchase from negative a lot to positive a lot uh, for organization, which I believe this is a, a signer or sorry, a uh, BSO rule, our commodity code approvers. And you can see here we've got a nice long list of all the commodities. So instead of having multiple rules for your commodities, you're just adding multiple commodities to your rule. So this is a good example of kind of how we can reorganize the way we think about rules and really hopefully kind of trim things back. Uh, we try to do our best with conversion where we could. So you can see here with like commodities, for instance, we we added them all in instead of having you know this rule repeated umpteen times to have all these commodity codes, which I think is the way we currently have it set up. You have to pick all of these individually. Um, now it's all on one page. If you need to review the approvers, so the approval profile in this case is software 4316. And the people who belong to that are Dean, or uh, Maisha and Pam. So at a, at a very high level, the way the solution is set up is to help you guys be able to organize and review rules much easier, uh, as opposed to needing to know how to rule, read like the, uh, the bulk load reports um, and probably asking me or asking anybody how a certain rule works based on you know, all the various setups that we have, now you have the ability to look for yourself, come in here and say, hey, how does um, 
approval needed for this vendor work. So for this one, I'm assuming it's going to have caliper selected. Yeah. So you can see the it's a very small to a very large number. So it fires for absolutely everything. Confirming and purchase, signer rule level, and then you can review the approver. So in this case, no one belongs to this. So the rule actually wouldn't fire. Well, correction. That's a whole other piece that I should talk about a little bit. Most of you are used to, uh, or at least have heard of the empty role replacement reason, um, the little system admin that pops up in Ariba when no one has been assigned to an approval profile. So in this case, this may be an example, kind of Shane and Sandra and Barb of something that might have been an, an EVA wide that needs to just be updated to be EVA wide instead of entity. Um, but it is still a good example of something that doesn't have an approver in it. Um, according to the system, looking at A194, which is the agency that we're in, and no one in A194 has order caliber. So what this will do when you're submitting a requisition is it will throw a, a hard error that will not let you through. And it will say, hey, no one is in this rule this approval profile. No one can approve for this. So instead of our current setup where you create a requisition, let's say it gets through four approvers and the fifth approver is system admin because it was empty and it sits there for, you know, sometimes days, weeks. Um, I know there's a recent one that I just sent over to, to Barb and Kelly um, where people just don't know why it's sitting there. Instead, now it will before they even click submit, or well, sorry, when they click submit the first time, it will say, hey, you need to put someone in this role. And then they will probably be contacting you guys to make sure that somebody has access to the role. Um, I'm trying to think of, that's probably a good, good point to pause and see if there are any questions. I'm sure I could go through a lot a lot more uh, details and examples, but I think at a, a basic level, that's kind of the, the overview of rules. Uh, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions, so kind of open that up. Bree. Hi, John, it's Bree. <laughs> um, so you showed us a little bit on the signer rules, how you could drill down to the specific commodities. Is it the same if I'm in the allocation section and I need to say drill down to a specific cost center? Absolutely. So, and let me, I don't know if this guy has, yeah, so like activity. Let's say you want to add it for all these that I just selected. You could select multiples in the rule itself. Okay. And then let me delete and, um, You mentioned that we're not going to be creating approved profiles, right? So, so as of right now, you're not, but I think you should be able to have it. I think that was something that was missed in the refresh in the user okay. manual. So yeah. that would be something day one that we could do because if not, you're going to get a lot of emails from me. Right. <laughs> that too. TGS creates them based on cost centers and have to create the role and add the role to the user and blah, blah, blah. And that's like half my day. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then in the commodity, is it just the NIGP commodity codes? I know like DOC has a bunch for technology and it's the other UNS or some C. Yeah, the UNSPSC. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, that's my favorite. I love saying that fast. Um, this is only NIGP because that's the only thing that's in the system. So okay. it's, it's gonna convert. Yeah. We need to take a yeah. look at how they do convert. Okay. That was it for me. Cool. Thanks. Anybody else? I sort of have a question. Yeah, sort of because. Yeah, so right now, and I know bulk load is a bad word, but you know, I can do a bulk load and I know I know how things are, right? So if I go in there now and I can do this quickie stuff right fast. And I really get confused 
and really squirreled it up. How do I know what was right? <laughs> Good question, Terry. <laughs> Don't say. So you mean when it converts <laughs> on day one, see if it's right? Or, or just, you know, I, I'm in there doing something for somebody and I start making the changes, but I don't really have what it looked like before I started making the changes. And then I got all wrapped around some other issue or something and messed it up. How can I get hey, back? Hey, John, let me uh, start there. So at a very starting point, we want, and this is why UAT is configured like production, we would want you to do that setup in UAT as best practice first to make sure that you have it where you want it before getting into production. Um, so that's one, that's kind of a policy procedure, best practice guideline that we, that we give. That's why it's set up this way. Um, two, there are things coming in to where uh, it's not shown here, but as you, when you make changes, especially to this page, because you can fill it up, um, as changes are made, you know, we're not storing the history, but at least we're making you put a description for where you are and go back. Um, so at least it's a little more control over, you know, what, what you did and why you did it. Um, there are some things in the background that will remember, you know, kind of know where the rule was, but I think the guidance around there is yes, this is a very powerful administrative tool. You, you need to leverage UAT to make sure you, you got what you want. Then you go into production, you do it in a very controlled manner, you describe the changes that you're making. Okay. So you'd have your production for your history as you're doing it. So you have your existing record. So what John's looking at here, what we're what we're adding to this page. Is when you go, it would all be read only when you came to it for an existing rule, and you'd have to hit a button to say, "I'm I'm making a change," and hopefully you give a good description of the change you're making, so that we can help you. Now, on the back end, there are some things that store some of this information, but we would hope that you'd have it in UAT correctly first, and validate it there before you start changing this data in production. And where's the spot where you put your data to say what you're doing? Uh, I don't think you see it here. It's like it's still in dev. It's, if you go to this, this there'll be a section above here. It'll all be read only where you have to say, I intend to make a change, check a box, and add a description for what you're doing. Okay. So that when you run for help, we can, we can know. <laughs> um, this is Felicia. Can you copy rules from one site to the other? Copy? No. Um, so it's a, a site level update um so this is you'd have to do one site at a time in this in this case um i know we've kind of been working on an etl which the bad word bulk load uh it that can help to be able to to do it at a more macro level um, if we need to you know like let's say you're setting up 300 sites i'm not i'm not asking you guys to go create all of that in here I think that can be a case by case. We work with you guys to kind of use that, uh, the, the ETL to be able to help do that at a, a bigger level, uh, in which case you would kind of copy. Um, it's like an Excel sheet that you work with. Um, but for now, and I think for day one, we're not planning on releasing that to be able to be used. It'll be just the UI. Does that answer your question? So um, a couple of things. So when you were talking about the, they're doing a requisition and nobody's in the role, they'll get an error message. So we're going to rely on the agencies to contact us. Jason will no longer be sending the emails that he sends now, correct? Yes. Okay. And will we be provided business case scenarios with set of instructions similar to what we have currently in our email administration guide? Ooh, I love those guides. Um, I would think we should do that at some point. I just don't know when in the timeline that will be done. But yeah, I think that would be, at least from a quick guide standpoint, day one to be able to have that uh, would be useful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just, I, I have to chime in there. Um, the best way to make sure you get what you want is get the help you need on the scenario and yeah, I hesitate to have us create the guide because we're going to write it 
in our particular way. Um, I do strongly encourage you guys to kind of own that because you own the business and, and own what you need to do. Um, I don't want to have us write it in such a manner that is not necessarily correct, right? Um, and get into those kind of back and forth. So who would be our point of contact if we needed assistance? Is that going to be a JIRA ticket or we're going to reach out directly to John? How does that I work? Yeah, I prefer we use JIRA just in case John's on vacation or John's away from his computer. Um, that way we get eyes on it. You know, we don't want to um, I know there's cases where we reach out directly, but as a standard, we do we do like to use Jira so that there's more eyes on it than one person to make sure we get you the help you need. Thank you. Hmm? <clears throat> yeah, I think in the in the long run. And kind of what we've done in the past is when when agencies come in and they say, hey, look, I, I want to really kind of flesh this out and, and make this workflow work for me and my my agency. Generally, I mean, getting in a room with them, I know with COVID it hasn't happened as often as I know it used to, um, but getting in a room and really kind of really whiteboarding, figuring out what what they need um, and then hopefully you can answer yes to a lot more of those questions. And I, I know I've been a part of a lot of those meetings in the past and I'm still available to be in those meetings moving forward. Um, so again, it's not meant to be, hey, here's all this stuff, go figure it out. Um, you know, when, when you need help, please don't hesitate to, to reach out and ask. Obviously, if, if everybody's reaching out and asking, I won't be able to answer uh, right away, but we're trying to get more people on our side with the knowledge uh, now that it's not as confusing, because um, I know there's probably at this point, um, you know, we probably between our two teams, there's four or five of us that really know how this works um, today. So moving forward, as you can see, it, it should be a lot easier to understand and really be able to master um, to be able to help moving forward. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that's the case, but I know on our side, on the CGI side, we're, we're working to get other people trained up to be able to help in those situations as well. Um, so we can go forward. So I think that's really all I had. I don't know. I didn't, I don't remember looking at the agenda, Barb. Was there any other topics um, that we wanted to talk about in this session today? I know this was a lot, but I don't think so, John. I think and I'm not sure that we had when we have well yeah, that's all that's all I really had to go through with rules. And again, I would highly recommend um, if you guys have interest in this, just thinking of rules you've heard about that maybe we you hadn't been able to do before. And just go try to do it in UAT for whatever organization it was and just see how it works. Uh, if you ever, just as a, a quick tip, if you're in as your user um, and you want to poke around with different rules, you can actually, when you create a requisition, you can change your organization here uh, to be able to be the other one. So like in this case, I'm, I'm the requester, but I can change it to, to match. So. Uh, and then if I save here, instead of having to like go back and forth, if you want to just do quick tests, you can do things like this, where you're you're in as your user, but you're creating for that organization um, to be able to do it kind of on the fly, quick and quick and dirty within uh, UAT. But again, to to Mark's point, and I think Terry you kind of summed it up well that really making all the changes you want to make in UAT to make sure it's correct. And if anything goes wrong, you always have prod as a backup because prod is the, the source of truth before you update prod. Um, you'll have that. And then we'll, we'll have the ability to, to hopefully help out in any of those scenarios where maybe there was a, a whoopsie and we need to, to go back to the way something was. Um, but again, at least that flexibility to be able to go back to where it was is not an overnight or a, I have to go into the 
code basically and hack something up. But you can see here, you now you can very easily just as your own user go poke around uh, to see how rules would work if you were using a certain organization. Um, so a lot of power. It's uh, once you get into it, if you have interest in that kind of stuff, it's really cool. Uh, if you don't, hopefully it's just a lot easier. So it's not as much of a pain. Um, but hopefully this gives you guys a, a pretty good overview and a good understanding of the basics. And then we can we can dive into the, the deeper ones later uh, as needed uh, for your guys' organizations. Yeah, I think as John mentioned, you know, I think most of you, if not all of you, uh, will use this time over the next two two and a half, three months to get comfortable with this. So you don't feel like, oh my God, I'm really going to screw this up. Because once you start using it, I think you'll pick it up really, really quickly. And then, you know, then you'll seek out our help for those edge cases where you go, oh my goodness, I don't, I don't know how to do this. Help me do it in UAT. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll give you guys some time back in your day unless there's anything else you need to go over. Hey, hey, Barb. Um, do you want to send me, I know we did some topics, but I, I don't remember when we and Shane talked specifically what tomorrow's topics were. Is it in the invite or do we have to adjust it all? It's in the invite. Uh, I'll okay. take a look at it based on today, but it's in the invite. Okay, thank cool. you. All right. <laughs>